We've been discussing wisdom gained from the ARC Forum using a tree metaphor. Pretty straightforward, right? The roots are strengthened by a better story, which gives rise to a trunk of freedom, right? That is empowered with responsibility to seek truth and to do good. You gotta get the freedom, but you're gonna use it for you know, putting some responsibility on your shoulders and then going out there and seeking the truth and doing good. Now, the branches of that tree represent the power of you doing your best so you can create strong families and communities. Now, in this fourth video of the series, we're going to discuss the fruits of the tree, which include economy and education, right? And their associated values, because economy is all about prosperity in many ways, and education is about wisdom. So we want to be both, right? And we want also all that to be inclusive so everyone can get on the success boat. We're all rowing together. Now, I want you to hear from the strictest headmistress in Britain, Catherine Birbal Singh. Now, she explains tough love in secondary schools and why it works. And then Ralston College President Stephen Blackwood highlights the opportunities we have with young adults going through a college education that allows them to have a better story and more optimism in their life. The controversial impact of capitalism, well, it's out there and it's explained by Maurice Glassman while Matt Goodwin, Rebecca Heinrichs, and Greg Sheridan explain the risks that we take if we don't believe in ourselves and use our wealth wisely. 90 seconds, elevator speech. Well, I'm Britain's strictest headmistress. I'm talking about the importance of schools, and in particular, when dealing with multiculturalism and how if we were to understand the crucial importance and the influence of our schools, how we can make multiculturalism work. Do you mind being the strictest headmistress in England? No, I quite enjoy it because strict means you love them enough to keep your standards high for them. Give me an example of something that you do that is strict and loving at the same time. Um, so, for instance, we have silent corridors. They have to move quickly, very quickly, to their lessons and in silence. People think that's mean, but actually what it means is they're in their lessons for longer. It means that if you're a child who's 11 years old with a chronological reading age of a 7-year-old, you're more likely to catch that up, which means you're not going to spend your life functionally illiterate. I think that's kind but some people think it's mean. <laughs> Thanks for showing your love. It's impossible to do every, you know, justice to what you said on stage, but give us the 90 second version for the folks who are curious about Ralston College and the wisdom you have about young kids. Well, bottom line is I think there are many young people who are seeking to live, live lives of, of meaning that they themselves can regard as, at the end of their lives, that they have lived a life with meaning. I think that's what every human being wants. And I think our culture, in a profound sense, is failing to give them the tools, the forms of life and culture that enable them to do exactly that. So at, at, at the deepest level, what Ralston College is about is a new college based in Savannah, Georgia, looking to re revive and reinvent the university. We're looking to open up young people to the pathways to their own realization. And we think that has a lot to do with learning from the past. There's a lot of things that human beings have thought and said, and the, the record of that is what we call the humanities. And so when you introduce, if you want to try and chart your chart course to a difficult life, you've got to begin by saying, well, who else has done this? Who, what can I learn from in the past? And that's what we try to give them. But not because simply we, not because we worship the past, but because we think it has wisdom that can enlighten our path into the complexities and difficulties of the present. And, and what we find is that there are millions of young people, we all know this, we're living in the midst of a meeting crisis, who are struggling to find their way. And as a culture, we have to do a better job of helping them do that. You have a very different political bent than many of the people at the conference. Yeah. And yet you, you said something very interesting. You said you're far too conservative to be a conservative to be a member of the Conservative Party. Yeah, because Conservatives, and this is the original sin of Conservatism going back to Burke, they don't understand the revolutionary nature of capitalism. That capitalism gives incentives to vice, to greed, to avarice, to the individual over the community. It displaces people. It turns God's creation into a commodity opportunity to maximize profit. And while a market economy is an absolutely necessary aspect of society, as is a state, a market society where care for your parents and care for your children is commodified, where the person is commodified, and all of this is just bonkers. So I was listening to the conference and saying, guys, you're worrying about the culture wars all the time, but you're not looking at the really important thing, which is how do you conserve the integrity of relationship, family, and human life? And you've got to recognize that capitalism is a huge disruptor of that. Well, so let me push back a little bit. Some would say that, that the left socialists mm -hmm. focus too much on money and power and not enough on values. How would you rebuke that? Okay, so there's many traditions in the left, and I could say certainly we despise Soviet Union and communism, and uh, that's a murderous creed. 
But socialism was an attempt by working people to build love and community with each other and to resist their dehumanisation. If the Conservatives had any intelligence, they'd tap into that. Yeah, so I think firstly there's a consensus that when we talk about revitalising left behind areas we're going to have to do something new that we're not doing currently. So on the left we heard from Morris Glasman saying look actually we need to rethink how we distribute capital, so we need regional banks and so forth, but then we also heard uh, Angus from Australia saying actually the, you know, that is not the answer, that kind of central planning type approach is not necessarily the answer. What was interesting to me, Andy Haldane, who led the levelling up work in the UK here, worked closely with governments, will no doubt be working closely with governments in the future, he was pretty open in saying actually we've got a lot of things wrong. And also I don't quite think people at the centre in Westminster or Washington or elsewhere, even now, nearly 10 years on from those big revolts in 2016, understand the nature of the frustration out there in the, in the, in the country, in the flyover country, in the left behind areas. What would be great going forward is to keep those guys in the room together because they've got immense experience. And I think as a panel, the amount of experience they've got between them in terms of advising leaders and prime ministers and others was, was enormous. So whittling that down into 20 minutes was a challenge. So really since the end of the Cold War, uh, both Republicans and Democrats believed that we've gotten to the point, sort of the end of history, and that really war between major nations was a thing of the past, that people have sort of evolved beyond that. And that if we could just conduct trade, commercialism would replace uh, all of these other ideas that, that would cause us to go to war. And so the West really got um, uh, flat-footed. We rotted out our defense industrial base. Meanwhile, our adversaries, they didn't believe that. And so you had the Chinese Communist Party, um, rather than becoming fat, happy, and liberalized, they're fat, happy, and they're still communists. And so they took that great wealth and they invested it into a military to push out the United States and supplant the West. You mentioned briefly that, uh, and it's come up at this conference, not toilet trading children has become common. And that's a hardship for the schools. You have five kids, but you totally train them. What's the secret? Um, one, I prioritize my family, and so I, um, I sort of joke and say I have five children. That's my long-term solution to save the West, and, and to do that well. They are my priority. If everything I do sort of in my professional life comes at the expense of, of raising happy and um, well-adjusted and virtuous and good kids, it's, it's not worth it. And so we've really prioritized that. I encourage young women to do the same thing and to understand that there's great joy in that, and there's hard, good work to do, but the results are worth it. Love the panel you're moderating, which means you have to, in theory, be listening a bit more attentively to this. <laughs> so share with us some of your insights. Well, uh, we're not responding to the challenge uh, in the West. Uh, partly we don't have self-belief. We don't understand our enemies because they do have self-belief, even if they got a lot less to believe in. Uh, there's a question mark over our resilience. Um, and there's a lot of work ahead for us. What scares you the most? What worries you? Well, I think the, the strength of purpose of our enemies and their unity. So the China, Russia, North Korea, Iran alliance, it's, it's virtually a military alliance now. So the day Joe Biden was in Israel expressing solidarity with Israel, Vladimir Putin was in Beijing being fated as a world leader by the Chinese. The North Koreans are giving him weapons and he pledges his eternal support to North Korea. The Iranians are sending drones to Russia. China protects them at the United Nations. Uh, they're all buying Russian fuel. Uh, they're buying each other's goods. They're trading much better. China is an infinitely more capable enemy than the Soviet Union was. Um, they're not 12 foot tall, they're not supermen, but that's, that's quite an adversary. You know, we're, we're, we're Muhammad Ali in a comeback and George Foreman is looking pretty formidable. <laughs> <laughs>